Great, thanks Chris, thanks for the, the warm welcome. Good to see you all. Uh, welcome to those online. I'm not kind of used to working online, so I, I tend to move around a lot, but I'll try and avoid doing that a little bit um, today. Uh, but my name's Mike. I'm going to talk to you about con something called concrete roles today, uh, which we'll get into in a bit, but I've spent the past 20 years as a youth worker, so I thought it'd be a bit of a remiss of me not to start with some kind of youth work ice-breaking activity, so sorry if you <laughs> don't like that kind of thing. But this is really simple, okay? Um, all you have to do for this activity is put your hands on your head or on your hips. That's, that's pretty much it. That's all I'm going to ask you to do. Um, and, and then I'm going to flip a coin, um, and... Um, It'll obviously land heads or tails, and if it lands on heads and you've got your hands on your head, you stay in the game. And, uh, if it, but if you've got your hands on your hips, obviously you go out of the game. Does that kind of make sense? And then it's kind of vaguely related, because whoever wins at the end um, will get some roses. So vaguely related to my thing. If you're online, um, if you win, you should still play, but if you win, hunt, you'll have to hunt me down for some, some roses. Um, it's slightly easier if you stand up. So if you don't mind, you can because you stand up, but you can still play if you can't. So st stand up now and um, I'll stay here. If you're online, still participate. Be good. Right, okay, so make your choice. Hands on your heads or your hips. Okay, my wife's gone with her hips. She's got some inside knowledge. It's a head! Sit down. <laughs> so if you've got your hands on your hips, um, you're, you've got, you're out. But now, now make your next choice. So round two. Yeah, make your choice for round two. Who's still in? Okay. Heads or tails? Let's see. Tails! So you've got your hands on your heads, you're out, sit down, at home, sit down. Okay, who's left? Right. Oh, we've still got a few. Okay, so make your choice again. Heads or tails? Okay, we've got one heads and everybody else tail. Oh, no, two heads. Okay, all right, fair enough. Okay. Heads! Ah, so just, you're still in. You had your hands on your head. Yeah, don't go out too. I'm afraid you're out. So it's a, it's a shoot off. So. Do you, does one of you want to go heads and one of your tails? Just to, okay, brilliant. So we're going to have a winner. I don't know what's going on at home, but we'll see. Tails, you're the winner. Congratulations. Let me, let me come and I'll be back. Well done. <laughs> Excellent. So hopefully that warmed you up. I have got a packet of roses, so you'll all get um, you'll all get some roses at the end on the way out. So don't. Uh, uh, don't worry too much. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk to you about concrete rows, but that's a bit of an odd kind of name, isn't it? What does that mean? I mean, do we sell concrete? Uh, are we a flower shop? Do we sell roses? Do we sell concrete roses, what, whatever they might be? Um, I looked on our website, and the biggest hit on our website comes from people looking for cement <laughs> in, <laughs> in Cambridge, which um, they'll be disappointed, I've got to say. Um, but the most common question I get asked by everyone is, is where does your name come from? So I'll let you into a secret. It comes from a poem. It comes from a poem by the rapper Tupac, and it's called The Rose That Grew From Concrete. And I'll read it out to you. Um, we might have a slide with it on as well, so you can follow it, but uh, I'll read it out. It goes like this. It says, Did you hear about the rose that grew from the crack in the concrete? Proving nature's laws wrong, it learned to walk without having feet. Funny, but it seems that by keeping it dreams, it learned to breathe fresh air. Long live the rose that grew from concrete when no one else even cared. You see, you wouldn't ask why the rose that grew from the concrete had damaged petals. On the contrary, we would all celebrate its tenacity. We would all love its will to reach the sun. And for me, this speaks about beauty coming from quite a difficult place, quite a dark place, struggle to become something beautiful. And that's what we're about as an organisation. We're about, we work with young people that have faced difficult starts to life, had traumatic childhood experiences and helping them flourish and fulfil for what, for me, is their God-given potential. I said, didn't I, at the start that I've spent about 20 years as a youth worker, and that's true, for a variety of organisations, for the Prince's Trust, and for a people referral unit, and for 12 years for an organisation called Romsey Mill, who I'm sure you might know well, partner with the Beacon Trust, and there's still an ongoing partnership uh, there. But during that time, I worked with lots of young people, thousands of young people, but I saw so many young people who would leave difficult home situations where maybe there was violence or addiction or, or negative things going on, or sometimes leave care and go for the, from those situations to large, impersonal, hostile environments at kind of 16, 17, 18, and the wheels fall off. There's a lot of added vulnerability, 
not enough support, a lot, lot of risk, disincentives to work. And I just got to a point of feeling this can't be right. We've got to do something different. And actually, probably in the first lockdown, when I had a bit of a chance to step back and pray, felt God giving me the mandate to create homes for young people. There's one young person I remember, I think there is a slide, but we'll call her Sarah. I worked with Sarah for a couple of years. And I met her when she was at the YMCA. She just had a miscarriage. Uh, she was struggling a little bit. Um, and, and she actually got thrown out of the YMCA for um, rent arrears. And in two years, she moved nine times in those two years. And she went from temporary accommodation to temporary accommodation to hostel to a refuge. She was in a caravan at one point. She went from abusive relationship to abusive relationship looking for love. And I just remember every stage I thought, I can't be able to do this differently. Especially as a church, we've got to be able to do this differently. I kept feeling, if only we could provide a loving, supportive home, you'd have such a chance to make progress. But without that, it's really difficult. And so I stepped back from my role at Romsey Mill, set up Concrete Rose to, to, to provide homes for young people. And, and even more, I've been looking into more of the, the kind of statistics over the last couple of years, and they're really pretty depressing, actually. I've got some of them on the screen, but just to give you a few, I won't go through them all, but if you think of young people that are in care, okay, so in the, the legal kind of uh, guardianship of the state, a third of young people who leave care will be homeless within two years of leaving care. A third... That's ridiculous. It can't be possible. They still make up about 25% of the homeless population, still make up 40% of the prison population, but only make up 1% of the total population. It's not possible. 121,000 young people will still be at risk of homelessness in the UK. For me, that's just, it just can't be possible. So I felt this mandate from God to really create homes for young people. And the way we do that is we've got a supported lodging scheme. And that means what we do is we look for individuals, couples and families who have a spare room and prepared to open up their home to a young person, to accommodate a young person in that room. And then we provide lots of wraparound support to make that really happen well. Got a little promo video. Um, get the popcorn out. It's about six minutes long. And, um, but I'll come back after that. So enjoy. This will give you a fuller understanding of supported lodgings and what it is. Many young people across the UK and locally are at risk of becoming homeless or being housed in unsuitable accommodation. This includes young people who have faced traumatic childhood experiences, including unaccompanied asylum-seeking children, care leavers, and those from difficult family backgrounds. Concrete Rose provides loving, stable, and supported accommodation for those aged 16 to 21 through a supported lodging scheme. We're looking for individuals, couples, and families who have a spare room, a desire to make a difference, and are prepared to open their homes to a young person. It's a bit of an interesting blend, I would say, the, the role of a supported lodgings host. Um, I would say it's a, it's a mixture between a maybe a nurturing family member, so that could be kind of um, feel quite parental, or maybe an older sibling, or like a, a kind of trusted auntie or uncle. Um, it can be a mentor role, it can be a, a teacher, an advisor. It, it really depends on the young person, what's going on for them at the time, and I suppose the kind of the way a host is naturally as well. So it, it kind of fluctuates and changes depending on, on what's going on for the young person, really. Through supported lodgings, I think you get the support a young person may need. They'll learn independence for one but like they won't just kind of be chucked straight out there into the world, you know, they'll have someone there who can care for them, can just have that best interest at heart, um, and actually just help them become independent as well, you know. There were, there were quite a few benefits of being a supported lodgings host. So firstly, it was fun. It was, um, you know, I, I quite enjoy spending time with teenagers and young people. And it was, it was often entertaining, it was, you know, you learned to 
not expect anything because it, you would get something different. Um, and yeah, it keep. I remember feeling that it kept me feeling quite youthful in terms of you know there was a lot of energy and that's and and a lot of inquisitiveness and curiosity on on both my part and the part of the young person so yeah i think that kind of sense of yeah energy and vitality you get from having a young person around you and in your house is is really lovely i think that the main support that i provided for all of them was emotional support so because you're there all the time it's not like you're you're a support worker who's just there during office hours you're there before they go to bed when they get up first thing in the morning so you see them at the really vulnerable times of day so doing that you know you spend quite a bit of time comforting them helping them stay safe in different ways. One of the most exciting parts is when they first move in, so the first day. So you know a bit about them and you've probably met them uh, maybe a few times. So what I would usually do on the first night is, you know, get a takeaway or get some food that they really liked and then, you know, just do something quite low key just so we could kind of spend time together. But so they didn't feel like I was really like focused on them. but. Yeah, just chill out and listen to music, watch telly, you know, watch a film and, and just chat. And uh, that first night, I remember, because I think I had four different young women over the five years I did it. And yeah, I, I remember all of them and how different they were, really. I think it's uh, important to have a youth worker because although you have the relationship with like your host and, and someone like that who, who really is kind of like a sort of a parent in some ways. Um, I think there's some things you won't tell people, especially that you live with, um, you know, the authority, the adult. There are just certain things you don't. And I found that with me, when I have my youth worker, um, I tell him certain things I wouldn't tell them. And I think you just, it's nice having that person outside of the family home or the home that you live in to kind of feel that you can talk to and I don't know, just feel comfortable. Um, the youth worker I had um, always had like just my best intentions at heart. He always wanted to make sure I was doing what I want to do, trying to find out what it is I want from life um, at that age as well. It's very important because, like I said before, I think you can just get lost, you know. And I just think having that guidance and someone who can see something in you that you may not see yourself is just is priceless. So the first young woman. I Stay with me, stayed with me for two years, so it's with me quite a long time then. And she she was the one I referred to who was who was quite emotionally in quite a, a, a very sort of in a very traumatized place when she came to me. Um, she she ended up going to college and then when she left me after the two years, she went on to university and she moved into a student house with, with other students and tra to train to be a nurse. And when I helped to move, and I remember that day, her moving, I was very sad because I was very attached to her by that point. She was like a little sister, really. Um, however, I was also so happy for her because she was just this incredible, beautiful, confident young woman who, you know, had this, you know, this passion for caring for people and was going to do something with it. And, and that was a very, a very lovely day, I remember. And then a few years later, when she got married and I went to a wedding, that was also very, because I'd known her partner all through when she was staying with me as well. So yeah, so seeing her on her journey and, and beyond, and we're still in touch now. So that was, that's, a, that's the biggest highlight. Great, thanks for sharing that. So that gives you a bit of an overview of, of what we do, our kind of supported lodging scheme. But the other reason that I love the poem, and I, I kind of partly chose it for our name, um, was because it reminds me of another story of somebody who kind of bore the scars and damaged petals of a broken world, and that's Jesus. And, and I remember when I first became a Christian, I used to listen to a song by Lenny LeBlanc. I don't know if anybody knows Lenny LeBlanc, but... Um, uh, called Above All, and he had a line in there, 
uh, it was a great song, line in there, it said, like a rose trampled on the ground, he took the fall and thought of me above all. So another reason I wanted to pick that name is because it, it, it echoed something of the story of Jesus. And, and our Christian faith is very much at the heart of what we do. And all the young people that we support will have faced adverse childhood experiences or traumatic events in their childhood. But I want to broaden it out now a bit. It's not just about those young people. We still know that 50% of adults in the UK will have faced traumatic experiences. And I know all of us have just been through what's been quite a difficult time in terms of COVID, quite a traumatic experience. That might have traumatised us, it might not, but it's still been quite a difficult time. And what I've noticed when I've been researching, I've done a lot of reading around trauma-informed care and how we respond to that. You know, the best trauma therapist that I know is Jesus. <laughs> Absolutely. And the best therapeutic approach comes from God. So I just wanted to share a little bit about that and my understanding of that and how it really fits into the Christian faith. You know, when it comes to traumatic experiences, there's often, in the literature, you'll find some kind of defining principles of, of traumatic experiences. Um, and they're all met, I think, in the traumatic experience that Jesus um, encountered on the cross. One of them is, is a lack of agency. When we face traumatic experiences, generally we feel like we can't, it's too overwhelming, we can't respond to it, we have no agency in it. Well, Jesus certainly gave up that agency by submitting to God's will on the cross. He gave up his kind of defined right to overcome that situation by saying, no, not my will, but yours. I mean, Philippians put it like this, doesn't it? He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. So that's one aspect of traumatic experience. The second aspect of traumatic experience is, is they generally, they, they overwhelm us and we think we're going to be annihilated or suffer significant physical harm. And that's a kind of hallmark of a traumatic experience. Well, well, Jesus was annihilated, certainly bodily, wasn't he, um, from our, for, for, for us. And, and Psalm 22 puts it like this. My life is poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Thirdly, a hallmark of traumatic experiences is shame. Often we feel shame when traumatic experiences happen to us. I must be so bad for this to happen to me. Or because it's happened to me, I am bad, if that makes sense. Well, Jesus certainly experienced shame on the cross. You know, the, the kind of um, way people were crucified was to be stripped naked and then crucified by the Romans. Hebrews puts it like this. He said, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And the fourth thing, hallmark of traumatic experiences, is generally rejection or betrayal, especially in relational trauma, uh, especially where there's maybe been abuse or violence, those that you look to to be your caregivers or those that you look to for support maybe are not the kind of support you need or let you down. Well, I think, again, that was met in the life of Jesus. Jesus was, you know, betrayed by Jesus, uh, D Judas, denied by Peter, mocked by the soldiers, and on the cross cried out, my God, my God, why do you forsake me? And yes, that was a reference to Psalm 22, obviously, but also something when he encountered and being separated from God by our sin. I think he understood something of what it is to be rejected. And so what I want to say to you today, all of us online here, is that Jesus understands trauma, okay? He understands trauma. He's been through it. But there is hope. You know, most of the young people we work with will have experienced trauma, as I said, because maybe they've been in care. We've also had a number of unaccompanied asylum-seeking children referred to us, probably fleeing war or famine, and certainly also had difficult crossings. And so what we've done is we've spent a long time working on our therapeutic approach. Okay, people have experienced trauma, but how do we respond to that effectively? How do we bring hope? How do we help people flourish? How do we help young people overcome that? Well, again, I, I think the Christian faith is the best therapeutic approach I know. So I just wanted to go through how we, how, how we approach trauma and helping healing and recovery, but how it refers to all of us as Christians. I realise this is quite a heavy topic for a Sunday morning, but actually I feel there's real hope in here. So firstly we say what's important is that everything must be underpinned by love. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of bit of a hero of mine called Bruce Perry. He's a, he's a leading psychiatrist in, in child trauma. And he says this, the most powerful therapy is human love. And I'd say he's kind of right. It's probably, for me, it's the second most powerful therapy. The first most powerful therapy for me is God's love. You know, we sang, didn't we, earlier? See, from his head, his hands, his feet, 
sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? I think that's what a picture that is. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet as the creator of the world dying on the cross? I don't think so. Was e'er such love apparent? Serene Jones, in a great book, which I'd recommend to you, called uh, Trauma and Grace, said this, On the cross, Jesus is consumed by violence and sin, yet he does not let it conquer love. So our underpinning of everything we do is love, okay? Uh, but then we have four principles, all beginning with P, nicely, of, um, of our therapeutic approach, which we try and apply to the young people we work with, but I think apply to all of us as Christians. So the first one is peace. Okay, the first P is peace. Um, for, for a concrete rose perspective, we try and give every young person peace by putting them in a stable environment, putting them in a home that's peaceful and where they can experience love. So the first thing is peace. But God does much more than that for us, doesn't he, as Christians? For me, he gives us an eternal peace and an earthly peace. An eternal peace because everything we've ever done wrong he is forgiven and we can be reconciled to him. Um, I think I've got this on the slide, but I love this verse from Isaiah. It says, Surely you took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we consider him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Eternal peace because of what Jesus did. But earthly peace, you know, God says the peace of... The, um, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and mind. And Jesus promises to never forsake us or abandon us. So peace, number one of our therapeutic approach is peace, but as Christians we have access to so much more in terms of peace. The second is people. And I'll just give you another, I, I like my quotes today, but I'll give you another quote by Bruce Perry, the guy I referred to earlier. I'm really a big fan of Bruce Perry. He says this, he says... The research on the most effective treatment to help child trauma victims might be accurately summed up this way. What works best is anything that increases the quality and number of relationships in a child's life. People, not programs, change people. And we try and do that at Concrete Rose. You might have noticed we give every, youth worker, every young person a youth worker, um, possibly from Romsey, possibly from, 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 from Beacon, who knows? But we give every young person, depending on where they're located, a youth worker to have youth work support. They've also got the relationship with the host, and they've also got relationships with the Romsey Mill core team. So we pack relationships around young people. But Jesus does that for us, doesn't he, through the cross, because we are adopted into his family. As Christians, we are adopted into this multi-generational, multinational, multilingual, multi-ethnic family that we can call Jesus our brother, God our father, and all of us, together in the church, brothers and sisters. So the second thing is people. So we've had peace and we've had people. The third thing is, per, is personal significance. So for, for us at Concrete Rose, what we're trying to get across is that every young person is significant. We're trying to get them to understand that they're significant. And we do that by, if they have relationships with people who view them as significant, who care about them, who care about their future, who can celebrate what they achieve, that gives personal significance. Again, there's a leading um, psychiatrist who says this, the roots of significance are to be found in the sense of being understood by and existing in the mind and heart of a loving and self-possessed other. So if we exist in the mind and the heart of somebody else, we feel significant. Well, we certainly exist in the mind and heart of God. We were bought at a price by Jesus on the cross, weren't we? Bought at a price. That's how significant we are to him. When I was, I got, I got saved in Chamonix in the mountains, and um, Psalm 8 was probably the key thing for me. You know, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, who is man that you are mindful of him? the son of man that you care for him. I was in these amazing alpine mountains thinking, who am, I'm so insignificant. And yet it goes on to say, yet you set him a little lower the, than the angels. Yet I'm so insignificant, yet I am significant to God. That juxtaposition did it for me. I'm nothing, but the number of hairs on my head are numbered. <laughs> you know, I was, put, I was knit together in my mother's womb by a God who cares. We have so much personal significance from a God who loves us. So we've had peace, <laughs> people, personal significance. My last P is purpose. So from a concrete rose perspective, we try and give every young person purpose. 
We want to encourage their skills, their dreams, their hopes, their aspirations. We want to help them get into work. We provide them with work experience opportunities. So we give purpose. But in Jesus, we have purpose, don't we? Jesus says, I've come that you have life and life to the full, life in all its fullness. Echoing that kind of Jeremiah, you know, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, plans to give you a hope and a future. That's what God says of you, of every one of us here. You know, and even in the church, you know, we are all together in Christ's body and each of you is part of it. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians. If we don't play our part in the church, then this church is poorer for it. We are here for such a time as this, in such a place as this, for a reason that God's put us here. So we have purpose. Okay, so I'm coming to the, to the end, don't worry. But in closing, so why am I here, you know? <laughs> What's the point? Well, to be honest, I need the church. We need people of like mind. I need Christians to make this initiative happen. It won't happen without it. And I think that's, there's a couple of reasons for that for me. One is because we have access to the love that God has given us. We can love in a different way because God first love does. We can show a love that always perseveres or never gives up, always hopes, never fails because we have access to that love from God. But the second is, <laughs> maybe we're a bit mad, <laughs> but maybe we follow a gospel that has a different message than what the earth says. You know, um, The second question I get asked most after why did your name come from is why would I have a young person in my home? And I get it, it's, it seems a bit mad especially in the British culture where my home is my castle I totally get it but as Chris read earlier the gospel mandate is a bit different isn't it we're told to deny ourselves and take up our cross you know we're not called to a life of, of kind of self-seeking or comfort we're called to something totally different basically it will be fulfilling you know it's, it's not only counterculture it's counterintuitive Chris in the same passage it says for those who give up their life will gain it. And if you try and gain your life, you'll lose it. How does that make sense? It won't make sense to the world what we're doing, but somehow it will be fulfilling and rewarding. So I'm appealing to Christians because we follow a different message than the world. We are countercultural. Um, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we've all got to become hosts. <laughs> if, you, if you want to become hosts, brilliant. You know, see me at the end. I get, it's not appropriate for everyone. We might not have the space, we might not have the capacity, we've got other things going on, and I know you're giving out in so many ways. That's not what I'm saying. But I do need the church to help in some way. And I wonder if all of us in this room and online, whoever's online, whether you can help us in one of four ways. Okay? So I've got four ways in which you could help us. And again, I've made them all begin with P, <laughs> because I thought you'd like that. Um, the first thing is you can... You can pray for us. Now, don't say that glibly. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not. It's against powers and principalities of the evil one. We need your prayer. If you could cover us in prayer, if you could commit to praying regularly, if you want our prayer newsletter, please get in touch. Please, can you pray for us? Can you help us with our profile? We're a new charity, <laughs> new organisation. Actually, community interest company, but not for profit. We're a new organisation. We've only been around, well, less than a year. Nobody knows about us. So any way you could help our profile, that would be amazing. If you can follow us on social media or um, tell about us to your neighbours and your workplaces, if you can suggest where we should put some stuff, that would be great. If you can retweet, rehash, whatever it is, the stuff that we send out, that would be amazing. Thirdly, can you pay for our work? Now, that's not a nice way of putting it, but it's the only thing that began with P. Can you, know, can you donate to the cause? Um, we, do need, we do need donations to keep us going, particularly to pay for some of that wraparound support we offer young people, uh, youth work support. So if people can uh, contribute in any way, we'd be most grateful of that. But fourthly, can you participate in any way? Could you open your home to a young person? We'll give you loads of wraparound support. We'll support you. We'll support the young person, 24-7 support. Could you participate in some way? Or if you know somebody who might be able to participate, could you raise our profile and tell, tell them about it? Okay, so we've covered so much ground today. I've told you about concrete roles, about a trauma-informed approach, how it applies to us as Christians, how you can participate. I know that's loads. So I've not got much to go. In fact, I just want to... I started with a poem. I want to finish with a poem. I want to finish with a poem which puts the focus back on Jesus and what he achieved for us on the cross. This is a poem by a free church minister, Edward Shilito, or Shilito, I'm not sure, during World War I. I'm going to read it. I mean, you know, just... Uh, you, you might want to just 
Just put your focus on God is what I'm saying. You might want to just relax. You might want to close your eyes. Let me read it over you. But let us have our heart attention on Jesus who paid the ultimate price for us. Okay. If we have never sought, we seek thee now. Thine eyes burn through the dark, our only stars. We must have sight of thorn pricks on thy brow. We must have thee, O Jesus of the scars. The heavens frighten us. They are too calm. In all the universe, we have no place. Our wounds are hurting us. Where is the balm? Lord Jesus, by thy scars, we claim thy grace. If when the doors are shut, thou drawest near, only reveal those hands, that side of thine. We know today what wounds are. Have no fear. Show us thy scars. We know the countersign. The other gods were strong, but thou wast weak. They rode, but thou didst stumble to a throne. But to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. And not a God has wounds, but thou alone. Great. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Um, uh, I know it's quite a heavy subject, but I really appreciate it. Three roses at the end, and I'd love to chat to you more about what we do. Um, thanks very much. <laughs>